To understand this, you have to go back to what young brother here referred to as the house Negro and the field Negro back during slavery. There was two kinds of slaves. There was the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro, they lived in the house with master. They dressed pretty good. They ate good because they ate his food. What he left. <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement, but still they lived near their master. And they loved their master more than the master loved himself. They would, they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would. The house Negro, if the master said, we got a good house here, the house Negro said, yeah, we got a good house here. Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. If the master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house Negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house Negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick. He identified himself with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you came to the house Negro and said, let's run away, let's escape, let's separate, that house Negro would look at you and say, man, you crazy. What you mean separate? Where is there a better house than this? Where can I wear better clothes than this? Where can I eat better food than this? That was that house Negro. In those days, he was called a house nigger. And that's what we call him today because we still got some house niggers running around here. This modern house Negro loves his master. He wants to live near him. He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near his master. And then brag about, I'm the only Negro out here. <laughs> I'm the only one on my job. I'm the only one in this school, you nothing but a house Negro. And if someone come to you right now and say, let's separate, you say the same thing that the house Negro said on the plantation. What you mean separate? From America? This good white man? Where you gonna get a better job than you get here? I mean, this is what you say. I, I ain't left nothing in Africa. That's what you say. Why you left your mind in Africa. On that same plantation, there was the field Negro. The field Negro, those were the masses. There was always more Negroes in the field than there was Negroes in the house. The Negro in the field caught hell. He ate leftovers. In the house, they ate high up on the hull. The Negro in the field didn't get nothing but what was left of the insides of the hog. They call them Chetlins nowadays. <laughs> in those days, they call them what they were, guts. That's what you were, a gut eater. And some of you are all still gut eaters. The field Negro was beaten from morning till night. He lived in a shack, in a hut. He wore cast off clothes and he hated his master. I say he hated his master. He was intelligent. That house Negro loved his master. But that field Negro, remember, they were in the majority and they hated the master. When the house caught on fire, he didn't try and put it out. That field Negro prayed for a wind. 
for a breeze. When the master got sick, the field Negro prayed that he died. If someone come to the field Negro and said, let's separate, let's run, he didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here. You got field Negroes in America today. I'm a field Negro. The masses are the field Negroes. When they see this man's house on fire, you don't hear these little Negroes talking about our government is in trouble. They say the government is in trouble. Imagine a Negro, our government, I even heard one say, our astronauts, they won't even let him near the plant. And our astronauts, our Navy, that's a Negro that's out of his mind. That's a Negro that's out of his mind. Just as the slave master in that day used Tom, the house Negro, to keep the field Negroes in check, the same old slave master today has Negroes who are nothing but modern Uncle Toms, 20th century Uncle Toms, to keep you and me in check, keep us under control, keep us passive and peaceful and nonviolent. That's Tom making you nonviolent. It's like when you go to the dentist and the man is going to take your tooth. You're going to fight him when he starts pulling. So they squirt some stuff in your jaw called Novocaine to make you think they're not doing anything to you. <laughs> so you sit there and cause you got all that Novocaine in your jaw, you suffer peacefully. <laughs> Blood running all down your jaw and you don't know what's happening because someone has taught you to suffer peacefully. The white man do the same thing to you in the street. When he don't want to put knots on your head and take advantage of you and don't have to be afraid of you fighting back, to keep you from fighting back, he get these old religious Uncle Toms to teach you and me that just like Novocaine, suffer peacefully. Don't stop suffering, just suffer peacefully. As Reverend Cleek pointed out, let your blood flow in the streets. This is a shame. And you know he's a Christian preacher. If it's a shame to him, you know what it is to me. <laughs> because nothing in our book, the Quran, as you call it, Koran, teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send them to the cemetery. <laughs> That's a good religion. In fact, that's that old time religion. That's the one that Ma and Pa used to talk about. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a head for a head, and a life for a life. That's a good religion. And then anybody, no one, resents that kind of religion being taught but a wolf who intends to make you his meal. This is the way it is with the white man in America. He's a wolf, and you a sheep. Anytime a shepherd, a pastor, teach you and me not to run from the white man, and at the same time teach us don't fight the white man, He's a traitor. 
to you and me. Don't lay down our life all by itself. No. Preserve your life. It's the best thing you got. And if you got to give it up, let it be even Stephen. The slave master took Tom and dressed him well and fed him well and even gave him a little education, a little education. Gave him a long coat and a top hat and made all the other slaves look up to him. Then he used Tom to control them. The same strategy that was used in those days is used today by the same white man. He take a Negro, so-called Negro, and make him prominent, build him up, publicize him, make him a celebrity, and then he becomes a spokesman for Negroes and a Negro leader. I would like to just mention one thing else quickly, and that is the, the uh, method that the white man uses, how the white man uses these big guns or Negro leaders against the black revolution. They are not a part of the black revolution. They're used against the black revolution. When Martin Luther King failed to desegregate Albany, Georgia, the civil rights struggle in America reached its low point. King became bankrupt almost as a leader. Plus, even financially, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was in financial trouble. Plus, it was in trouble, period, with the people when they failed to uh, desegregate Albany, Georgia. Other Negro civil rights leaders of so-called national stature became fallen idols. As they became fallen idols, began to lose their prestige and influence, Local Negro leaders began to stir up the masses. In Cambridge, Maryland, Gloria Richardson. In Danville, Major uh, Danville, Virginia, and other parts of the country, local leaders began to stir up our people at the grassroots level. This was never done by these Negroes whom you recognize of national stature. They controlled you, but they never incited you or excited you. They controlled you. They contained you. They kept you on the plantation. As soon as King failed in Birmingham, Negroes took to the streets. King got out and went out to California to a big rally and raised about, I don't know how many thousands of dollars. Come to Detroit and had a march and raised some more thousands of dollars. And recall, right after that, Wilkins attacked King, accused King and the Corps of starting trouble everywhere and then making the NAACP get them out of jail and spend a lot of money. And then he accused King and Corps of raising all the money and not paying it back. This happened. I got it in documented evidence in the newspaper. Roy started attacking King and King started attacking Roy and Farmer started attacking both of them. And as these Negroes of national stature begin to attack each other, they begin to lose their control of the Negro masses. And Negroes was out there in the streets. They was talking about, we're going to march on Washington. By the way, and right at that time, Birmingham had exploded, and the Negroes in Birmingham, remember, they also exploded. They began to stab the crackers in the back and bust them upside the head. Yes, they did. That's when Kennedy sent in the troops down in Birmingham. So, and right after that, Kennedy got on the television and said, this is a moral issue. That's when he said he's going to put out a civil rights bill. And when he mentioned civil rights bill and the Southern crackers started talking about they were going to boycott it or filibuster it, then the Negroes started talking about what? We're going to march on Washington, march on the Senate, march on the White House, march on the Congress and tie it up, bring it to a halt. Don't let the government proceed. They even said they were going to go out to the airport and lay down on the runaway and don't let no airplanes land. I'm telling you what they said. That was revolution. That was revolution. That was the black revolution. It was the grassroots out there in the street. 
Scared the white man to death. Scared the white power structure in Washington, D.C. to death. I was there when they found out that this black steamroller was going to come down on the Capitol, they called in Wilkins. They called in Randolph. They called in these national Negro leaders that you respect and told them, call it off. Kennedy said, look, y'all letting this thing go too far. And old Tom said, boss, I can't stop it because I didn't start it. I'm telling you what they said. They said, I'm not even in it, much less at the head of it. They said, these Negroes are doing things on their own. They're running ahead of us. And that old shrewd fox, he said, well, if you all aren't in it, I'll put you in it. I'll put you at the head of it. I'll endorse it. I'll welcome it. I'll help it. I'll join it. The very a matter of hours went by. They had a meeting at the Carlisle Hotel in New York City. The Carlisle Hotel is owned by the Kennedy family. That's the hotel Kennedy spent the night at two nights ago. Belongs to his family. A, a philanthropic society headed by a white man named Stephen Currier called all the top civil rights leaders together at the Carlisle Hotel and told them that by you all fighting each other, you're destroying the civil rights movement. And since you're fighting over money from white liberals, let us set up what's known as the Council for United Civil Rights Leadership. Let's form this council and all the civil rights organizations will belong to it and we'll use it for fundraising purposes. Let me show you how tricky the white man is. And as soon as they got it formed, they elected uh, uh, Whitney Young as the chairman. And who you think became the co-chairman? Stephen Currier, the white man. A millionaire. Powell was talking about it down at the Cobo today. This is what he was talking about. Powell knows it happened. Randolph knows it happened. Wilkins knows it happened. King knows it happened. Every one of that so-called big six, they know what happened. Once they formed it with the white man over it, he promised them and gave them $800,000 to split up between the big six and told them that after the march was over, they'd give them 700000 more. A million and a half dollars split up between leaders that you've been following, going to jail for, crying crocodile tears for, and they nothing but Frank James and Jesse James and uh, what you call it, brothers. <laughs> Soon as they, they got the setup organized, the white men made available to them top public relations experts. Opened the news media across the country at their disposal. And then they begin to project these big six as the leaders of the march. Originally, they weren't even in the march. You was talking this march talk on Hastings Street. Is Hastings Street still here? <laughs> on Hastings Street. You was talking the march talk on Lenox Avenue. And down on, uh, what you call it, Fillmore Street. And Central Avenue. And 42nd Street and 63rd Street. That's where the march talk was being talked. But the white man put the big six ahead of it, made them the march. They became the march. They took it over. And the first move they made after they took it over, they invited Walter Ruther, a white man. They invited a priest, a, uh, a rabbi, and an old white preacher. Yes, an old white preacher. The same white element that put Kennedy in power labored, the Catholics, the Jews, and liberal Protestants. Same clique that put Kennedy in power joined the March on Washington. It's just like when you got some coffee that's too black 
which means it's too strong. What you do, you integrate it with cream. <laughs> You make it weak. If you pour uh, too much cream in, you won't even know you ever had coffee. It used to be hot, it becomes cool. It used to be strong, it becomes weak. It used to wake you up, now it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> This is what they did with the March on Washington. They joined it. They didn't integrate it, they infiltrated it. They joined it, became a part of it, right. took it over. Right. And as they took it over, it lost its militancy. They ceased to be angry. They ceased to be hot. They ceased to be uncompromising. Why, it even ceased to be a march. It became a picnic, a circus. Nothing but a circus with clowns and all. You had one right here in Detroit. I saw it on television with clowns leading it, white clowns and black clowns. I know you don't like what I'm saying, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because I can prove what I'm saying. If you think I'm telling you wrong, you bring me Martin Luther King and A. Philip Randolph and James Farmer and uh, those other three and see if they'll deny it over the microphone. No, it was a sellout. It was a takeover. When James Baldwin came in from Paris, they wouldn't let him talk because they couldn't make him go by the script. Bert Lancaster wrote the speech that Baldwin was supposed to make. They wouldn't let Baldwin get up there because they know Baldwin liable to say anything. <laughs> they controlled it so tight, they told those Negroes what time to hit town. How to come, where to stop, what sign to carry, what song to sing, what speech they could make and what speech they couldn't make, and then told them to get out of town by sundown. <laughs> and every one of those times were out of town by sundown. Now, I know you don't like my saying this, but I can back it up. It was a circus, a performance. It beat anything Hollywood could ever do. The performance of the year. Ruther and those other three devils should get an a Academy Award for the best actors because they acted like they really loved Negroes and fooled a whole lot of Negroes. <laughs> and the six Negro leaders should get a, or an award, too, for the best supporting cast.